Inflation is going to stay high. It's going to make you poorer. Keep watching for more uplifting content like this. No, that can't be the intro. Let's start again. You hear a lot of talk about inflation. Rishi pledged to halve it. Jeremy explained to Oma Coffee. Ugh. But they're not telling you that over the next five to 10 years, inflation is going to stay higher than it's supposed to be. I'm saying that after spending three years deeply researching this stuff for my book, The Price of Money, which is out now, published by Penguin, and ooh, look at those reviews. And it's actually really easy to understand. It's just that no one's motivated to tell you the truth. In this video, I'll explain what inflation is doing to you now, why it's inevitable that it's going to continue. Then at the end, I'll give you five concrete steps that you can use to avoid being punished by it. Obviously, the price of everything has been going up faster than it should do recently and probably faster than your wages have. So that's making you poorer, but it's also making you poorer in another way. Let's say you're the type of person that Martin Lewis would strongly approve of. You're always squirreling money away and you're not shy to switch bank accounts to maximize the amount of interest you're getting on your savings. For over a decade, your rewards for doing that were pretty slim. Most banks were only paying out a fraction of a percent, but with the base rate of interest rising as it has been recently, you can now get 3% or even more which sounds great, that's so much better. Until you realize that with inflation running at 10% like it has been recently, your savings are actually losing value faster than they were before. Because previously, it was really obvious that your savings weren't doing anything for you in the bank. Now, it feels like they are, but in reality, you're sliding backwards even faster than you were before. And this is going to continue, and I'll explain why. This is the national debt. No, this is the national debt. Actually, this is the national debt. And here is how it's grown over time. And it's this growth of the national debt and how much it's now costing the country that holds the key to understanding why inflation is inevitable. I am inevitable. But why has the national debt grown so much? It's really quite simple. Say you've got a friend who's got a bit of a spending habit and they want to spend more than they're earning at their job. So for anything they can't afford, they just take out a bank loan. Next year, same thing. Maybe they're earning a bit more, but they still want to spend even more. So again, just add it to the bank loan. This is all great until at some point the bank says, all right, well, we kind of want our money back now. But clearly they don't have it. They've spent it. So all they can do is take out another bank loan to repay the first one. And with that new loan, they just do the same again. Even if their salary is growing, they just want to keep spending more and more. And so the loans that they're taking out get bigger and bigger. This is no different from what the government has done. In all but six of the last 50 years, they've spent more than they've brought in. So they just have to keep borrowing more and more. And every time a loan needs to be repaid, they just take out another loan to repay it with. So even as the economy grows, the debt just keeps growing faster. But this has been going on for a long time, so why is it suddenly becoming a problem now? Well, it's because the interest that they're paying on all that debt has suddenly got a whole lot higher. It's not really any different from your mortgage rate going up, but your salary staying the same. Roughly a third of government debt is directly tied to the base rate. So every time interest rates go up, their cost of borrowing goes up at the same time. For example, in November 2021, the base rate of interest was 0.1%, really, really low. But by November 2022, it had reached 3%. The effect of this was the government's borrowing costs in November 2022 were 50% higher than they had been a year earlier and the highest since records began. We're now spending more on paying interest on the debt as a country than we are on defence. And it won't be long until we're spending more than we are on education. And remember, this is just the interest. The actual debt isn't shrinking at all, and it's actually getting higher. The scary thing is, this is only going to get worse. There's still two thirds of the total debt that isn't tied to today's interest rates. But at some point, it'll need to be repaid and reborrowed at higher interest rates. So the amount that we're paying on just servicing the debt payments, it's going to get higher again. So at some point, they're going to have to do something about it. But what can they do? Well, they've got three options, but I'll just warn you, they're all bad. So option one is to try to reduce the number of pounds owed. And that's what you and I would think of when we talk about reducing debt. You borrowed a hundred pounds, you try and pay 20 off, so you now owe less than you did before. Now you can forget about this option straight away. It's not gonna happen. For them to pay the debt down, they need to first stop borrowing more. And remember, they are currently borrowing more and more every year. Remember we had that decade of austerity where there was no magic money tree, even after all that, after all the cuts that involved, 
they still only just about briefly got back to the point where they weren't adding to the debt. It didn't reduce the debt at all. That's not happening. So let's move on to option two, which is to grow the economy faster than the debt. So if the economy steams ahead and grows really fast, the national income is increasing quickly, then the share of the debt as a proportion of that national income can fall, even if the amount of debt itself is actually still going up. Well, that sounds a bit more plausible. So is it going to happen? Well, no, you can file this one under possible, but extremely unlikely because growth in the UK is slow and getting slower, which leaves option three, inflate the debt away. Imagine your sneaky granddad borrowed 500 pounds off someone in the 1930s. And in the 1930s, I know it's unbelievable, but 500 pounds was enough to buy a house in London. Well, that's fine. He can now pay the 500 pounds back from the comfort of his London home that's now worth millions. And his friend can barely buy a sofa with that 500 pounds for the home that he doesn't have because he loaned the money in the first place. Inflation reduces the value of money over time, which means it also reduces the value of debt over time. That's what happened in that example, and the government can do exactly the same thing. So how does that work? Well, government debt is currently about 100% of GDP, which just means the total value of everything produced in the country in a year. Then imagine that over the next year, everything that's produced in the country gets 10% more expensive because of inflation. So now, even though nothing extra is being produced at all, GDP, the total value of everything produced, has gone up by 10%. Well, now the debt has magically gone from being 100% of GDP to only 90% of GDP. So even though nothing's really happened, nothing extra is being produced, no debt has been paid down, it's fallen as a percentage. These are the only three ways the government can pay off the debt, and two of them are impossible. And as Sherlock Holmes knows, when you've eliminated all which is impossible, then whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. Actually though, Sherlock, it's not at all unlikely, because if you look closely, you're being softened up for this now. The Bank of England literally has one job, which is to try to keep inflation at 2%. I'm fired, aren't I? Oh yes. And every time they miss that target, they have to write a letter to the government explaining why. It's funny, you can actually go online and see all the letters that the governor of the Bank of England has had to write to the government over the last couple of years. And if you've got a project at work that's going badly and you need to justify it to your boss, this is an absolute treasure trove of inspiration. The 2% target has been in place for years. There's actually no particular reason that 2% was chosen in the first place. But recently, pieces have started appearing in the press about whether it might be sensible to adopt a higher target instead. This is a technique that's often used to plant the seeds for something that's likely to happen in the future, so it doesn't come as a shock and people are kind of prepared for when it does happen. Recently, a former Bank of England committee member suggested suspending inflation targets at times when they're being dramatically missed, which you'd have to be pretty brave to suggest at work. But maybe they can get away with having a higher target. And there's evidence from Google searches that until inflation gets past about 4%, no one seems to care about it that much. This is very convenient for the government because it suggests that if they can get inflation to about 4% and keep it there, no one's going to be that upset about it. No one's going to really notice. No one's going to ask for a pay rise. And yet it's going to make a big difference to them in getting that debt reduced. Actually, before we get to what you can do about it, I just need to do a quick geeky aside for the people in the comments section. I'm not saying that inflation won't come down from where it is now, or even dip to 2% and even below that at times. In fact, the rate of money creation, which was a big driver of inflation, has gone negative, which suggests inflation will be on its way down shortly. But if you look out over the next five to 10 years, for a variety of real world reasons like peak globalization, plus the sheer need for it to happen that I've talked about, inflation is going to remain higher than we've become used to. So what can you do about it? Well, I give you the full breakdown in my book, The Price of Money, but let's cover off the main points now. Well, awareness is the first step. And now you've got that. This isn't just something that's going to go away. It's not going to magically get better. And it is going to keep on erosing your savings as well as increasing your bills. Now, importantly, this doesn't mean that you should go and do risky things with your money that you don't understand. It's actually far better to lose 7% purchasing power in the bank than it is to go and invest it in something you don't really understand and lose 50% of it or more. But the first thing you can do is minimise the extent to which your savings are being eroded by shifting them into accounts that are paying the highest amount of interest you can find. You could even look at tying them up for some length of time, like a year or more, because that tends to pay a higher amount. That's not going to solve the problem at all, but it is going to make it a little bit less bad just by staying on top of it. And it's relatively easy to do. 
The next thing you can do is feel more relaxed about your debts. So you might have a mortgage rate that spiked up from 2% to 4 or 5%. And obviously that's not great, but that's still lower than the rate of inflation. So you might be feeling a lot of pressure now to pay down your debts. And maybe that is the right thing for you to do. I don't know your circumstances. But remember that inflation means the real value of your debt is being eroded all the time. It's exactly the same as if you'd borrowed money 100 years ago and that money is going to be worth less in the future. Exactly the same principle. So maybe it is good for you to pay down your debt, but debt can actually be a good thing under conditions of inflation. Remember, the government is using this trick to pay down its debts, and the same can work for you too. The next thing you can do is focus on investments that tend to do well under inflationary conditions. And this isn't easy because some investments do well when there's a bit of inflation, but not too much. Some should do well, but there might be some other reason why they don't. So this is not just like a blind recommendation for all this stuff, but it's just an indication of the type of places to go looking. The first is property. Well, it's in the name of the channel. The great thing about property is that rents tend to rise in line with earnings and earnings tend to rise in line with inflation eventually, even though they're lagging it at the moment. So your income stream is protected. And in the meantime, if you've got debt against the property, as we've already seen, that debt is being eroded. Second is investing in value stocks. So think Shell or Barclays rather than Meta or Tesla. The mechanics are a bit much to get into, but when you've got higher inflation and higher interest rates, companies that are profitable and providing something that our people really need and that are valued reasonably today are a lot more attractive than speculative companies that may do great things in the future. And you don't have to start picking individual stocks to do this. You can buy into funds, both active and passive, that focus on value companies. Third is index linked bonds. Yes, the very ones that are causing problems for the government at the moment. And that's because of the reason it is causing them a problem, because your payout increases with inflation. Again, you can access these through a fund. Personally though, I'm not such a fan, because even though the payout you receive increases in line with inflation, the actual value of the bonds could be negatively affected if interest rates go up further. And then fourthly and finally, there's gold, which is your classic inflation hedge. It hasn't actually performed that well as a hedge against inflation recently, but over hundreds of years, it has done. The other disadvantage of gold is it doesn't actually pay you any kind of income. And that's why I don't have loads of gold, but I do have some because in an inflationary environment, it tends to do pretty well. Again, though, don't just pile blindly into any of these. Use this video as motivation and incentive for going and finding out more about the different types of investments that you could make to not just protect yourself from inflation, but potentially to actually benefit from it. And if you do choose to use property as one of your ways of doing that, then go watch this video next because we talk about the best places in the whole country that you could be investing right now.